I mean, the, the big, I suppose, the, 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 you know, if, if you re go through your writings and if you go through uh, your essays, the kind of the big watershed in your writing was the Rushdie affair. Um, but what's interesting about that is that, is that even prior to uh, the fatwa, even prior to the book burnings, of course, your work, might be the laundrette, uh. faced a similar kind of contestation from, 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 from Islamists, didn't it? Well, in, in, in um, My Beautiful Laundrette, Saeed Jaffrey says in a rather fruity voice, our country is being sodomized by religion. It's being, beginning to interfere with the making of money. So there is some recognition that uh, uh, there is some religion around at that time. Um, but it wasn't until 89, the fatwa against Rushdie, that I guess people became aware in the West of, of what this might mean and, and, and what sort of fascism, I, I guess, or, or sort of fascist mindset it represented. And it was after that that I started to get really interested in it and started to talk to these kids and went to the... Uh, there was a college near my house where I used to go and meet them and so on. I wanted to write about because it. Before that, you, you'd never had... Unlike Salman, who was immersed in, in, in Islam, you'd never had any real attachment or interest in Islam prior to that. Is that right? Well, we were brought up to hate it. I mean, my father went to a school where he was beaten by Catholics, and then in the evenings he went to a school where he was beaten by Muslims. So um, uh, the, the boys of my family tended to keep away from uh, 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 religion. Um, and I guess we, 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 you know, we worshipped the movies and books and music and so on, and religion was seen as reactionary and possibly, as Nisha predicted, dying. Um, what a funny thing to think. Um, but the fatwa against Rushdie made me aware of the new brand, as it were, that I met all these kids who were younger than me, who, who wanted to live in an Islam, some form of Islamic state, and that seemed strange and, and odd to me, seeing as, you know, uh, their parents had come to Britain in order to, for, for them to, to, to live another kind of lifestyle. So it seemed very bizarre to me, and, and I couldn't wait to write about it, so I, I wrote the Black Album, then I wrote um, the story of my son, the fanatic, and then the movie of my son, the fanatic, which was really about um, generational conflict, but where the kids were, as it were, more radical and more conservative than their parents. And looking back, you know, twenty years back on, on on the Rushdie affair, I mean, what what do you see as both the lessons of it and the lessons we haven't learned from from the Rushdie affair? Well, it made me realise, made me aware of how. Fragile liberalism was. I think I just believed as I was growing up there would be more and more liberalism everywhere. You know, it would be like the 60s everywhere soon. Um, I didn't see that there were people who hated words, who hated books, who wanted to stop people thinking certain things. So I be became aware, you know, I grew up in the post-war period. It was, it was very safe and pleasant in the suburbs. You know, but we... Uh, the, there were no wars. It seemed like a little bubble. I think the fatwa made, made us aware that the rest of the world could, as it were, crash through the window at any time. And that it was a world where people couldn't speak, where people couldn't write books, or they couldn't criticise religion, or they couldn't say certain things. And it made me think about freedom of speech, maybe think about books, and maybe think about why people wouldn't want other people to speak and so on. And I saw that this was that all this stuff that I thought, as it were, had gone away, had come back in a different form and was very dangerous. You once said to me that um, you didn't think this satanic verses could be written today, let alone published. I mean, do you still feel that? Well, you take your life in your hands. You know, and if you want to do it, good luck to you. I wouldn't blame you. It would be a brave man who would want to criticise Islam or satirise Islam in that kind of way because the boys will be around your house half an hour later. And as, as we know, it is very dangerous to satirise certain things about Islam. Um, and, and in a way, that has now become a no-go area for people. And I think that's a terrible, terrible loss, because we need a big tension between, between um, let's say, authorities or various forms of religion and those who want to ask questions about it. Um, uh, uh, and insofar as people are afraid, I, I think that's a great loss to... To, to, to literature and to the West. But don't you also think that, in a sense, it's as much the fear as the problem, that people fear that 
that they will you know, that they can't write these things and therefore don't write it. Um, um, I think you should do it, Kenna. I think a comedy about the Quran would carry on up the Quran would be very very <laughs> would be a very brave and innovative thing to do, Kenan. I would my like to see book. it coming my, from your my, pen rather than book. rather than from mine. I think. <laughs> Carry on up the Quran. That's a good title, isn't it? <laughs> but I suppose what I'm getting at is that in a, you know one thing that is, seems to me has changed over the past twenty years is that we've come to um, morally accept that it's wrong to give offence. That it's not so much that you know that, that, that um, if we if we do something we fit, that, that the Islamists will come and. Uh, uh, burn our office down or our house down, which, which, they, which they may well do. But we ourselves have internalised the fatwa in a sense, um, and we've come to think that it's wrong to do that, to, to wrong to give offence, wrong to uh, offend other people's cultures. Yeah, and in the end, nobody would ever say anything about anything. Nothing would ever be said. You'd live in a world that was completely fascistic, you know, that, that would, you know, where people would be terrified of speaking, of being critical, etc. Everything would grind to a halt. It would be like, you know, North Korea. It would be an absolute hell. So it's important that writers, artists, politicians, journalists, everyone pushes <coughs> pushes all the time at, at, the, at the limits of what is decent, what is acceptable, and what gives offence. I mean, this notion of offending people is 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 ludicrous, um, because. You know, religions like Islam or Catholicism or whatever are very, very powerful. They can look after themselves, and it seems to me that they, a little bit of inquiry would be rather good for them, too. One of the things that's always struck me about, about this argument about, about offence is that when people talk about offending a culture, what they're really talking about is a, a dialogue within that culture. So it's not as if um, you know, Salman Rushdie was offending Muslims. He was having a dialogue from, from within that culture. And it always seems to me a confusion that people have between the idea of offending a culture and actually a dialogue, debate uh, going on within that culture. And they've never felt, I, they've I agree to with see that. that. In a sense, he was speaking from within. He was speaking the unconscious of Islam. I mean, he wasn't speaking from outside. Salman was brought up as a, as a Muslim. He knows all about it. He was speaking the truth of Islam from another point of view, which was why people were so annoyed by it. By it. And he was also speaking, speaking their own, as it were, hidden truth, their own fears about their own religion. Um, and I think that's what's terrified people. Which is why so many of the flashpoints in relation to free speech and Islam have actually been for about Muslim or minority writers over the past twenty years. There's, there's, this, there's a sense that this is, you know, there's a sense that people have that it's the outside world pushing denigrating Islam, but if, if you look at the writers who, who, who've been at the flashpoints, they've largely been minority writers themselves. Yeah, from within the community, as you say, people who, re who really know what they're doing, who can do the damage, as it were. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Just on your own writing, I mean, you're a, you know, you, you, you use many forms. You're a, you're a novelist, you're a playwright, you're a uh, script writer, you're an essayist. I mean, how do you kind of negotiate between those forms? I mean, when you when you think of it and a subject that you want to write about, do you think of it as a subject and the form comes afterwards, or or does the subject and the form go together? So 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 necessarily you, you would write a novel or a play or or, or a or, or, or a screenplay. Um, I tend to think about the money. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I teach creative writing for my sins. And, um, you know, this is a job. This, you're not just an artist. It's ludicrous to think of yourself as only being an artist, that you're working in a, in a co commercial form. You know, if I sit around in my house writing a load of short stories for which I'm going to be paid 200 pounds for each one, you know, and there's a hole in the roof and it's raining in the, in the attic, I've got to think about what I'm going to do next. So it's practical too. Um, you know, I've got to think, well, I could write a novel, I could write a movie, and then I can, I've got a bit of money, and then I can write some stories, I could write a couple of essays. I mean, you know, it's a practical business, being an artist. It's a commercial world, and I've got to make a living at it. And I think that's very important. It's, it's important to remember that, and it's important to, to be aware that you are living in a world of other people as an artist, otherwise you're, you, you're a goner. You couldn't survive. 
I mean, at the beginning, you don't think about that. When I began to write, I didn't think, how am I going to pay for my kids to go to school? I just thought, I need to be an artist. You know, 20 years later, I'm thinking, well, that'll pay the school fees. Um, and that's, that, that's what you do. And, 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 and I think that's important. I mean, the two most important f uh, forms in which... Uh, forms of art that, that I was interested in when I was a kid were the cinema and, and pop, pop music. And they're both... You know, these are commercial forms. There is an audience, and you're making work for them. We're making work, but we want to make interesting work for the market. So thinking about that is important for a writer. It's part of what a, what a, what a writer has to do. I mean, I know lots of writers, and all they ever think about is money. They think about their advances. They think about their agents. We never talk about sentences. We never talk about... <laughs> <laughs> we never talk about... You know, you meet a load of writers. Nobody ever says, what do you think about the structure of a novel? <laughs> They go, what did you get paid for your last book? Blimey, did you get, wow, is that all you got? <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, and that's the reality of being a, being a, you might say, a professional artist. You know, it's a real thing in the world. And you have to consider all this. But, you know, there are only certain things you can say in an essay and certain things that you want to say in a story and certain things that might be right for a movie and et cetera, et cetera, and other things that you can do in a novel in terms of length and digression and layering and so on that you can do in a novel. So you do think about all that too. But you think about all these things at once. It is it's quite a practical job. I like that about it. There's a, there's a, there's a line in the introduction to, uh, to this collection of essays where uh, you say that, I want to take the essential strangeness of the human being, both to himself and to others, as my subject. What do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, I don't even remember writing that. <laughs> the essential, the essential yeah. strangeness of writing. Yeah, the essential strangeness of that sentence. <laughs> um, well, there are, it's the uncanny, isn't it? The way in which the world strikes you as being uncanny, that there are people speaking. Um, or, or, or the strangeness of your own experience. You know, of having a child. The amazement, let's say, of having a child. And you'd think... As, if, as though nobody's ever had a child before. You know, and you look at this kid and, and the feelings are, are very strong. So it feels strange and you want to connect your sense of strangeness to other people's experience and so on. But you want to keep that sense of newness, of strangeness about the world that one always has alive in a piece of writing. So a piece of poem or, a, or an essay or a novel would capture the oddness of your being alive at this time now in this body with these people and so on. So it's to do with that, the freshness, oddness of the world it being there right in front of you in a very immediate way. It's like the world, is, it's, it's as though the world would always, every day, be traumatic in some way. As though waking up every day was like being hit over the head with a hammer. Is that one of the reasons you think that, um, you know, if you look at great British writing, or writers in, in, in English, um, so many of them are outsiders, Irish or um, Indian or Pakistani and so on. Um, because, maybe because in that sense, they, they feel dislocated and therefore they feel that strangeness that, 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 that's essential to writing. Um, I think it's a very odd thing to be a human being at all, myself. <laughs> so I don't think if you were Irish you'd feel that more, necessarily. <laughs> Though you might. Um, it's just to do with wanting to locate your experience in terms of other people joining it symbolically with, with, with that, of, that, that of others. So, as it were, it doesn't seem so bad. You'd think, oh, it, it would be as though when you were dying, someone said, well, everyone dies. Why would you worry? You know? um, but there is a very, you know, obviously very, something very, very strange about your own death. Um, and you, I would certainly want to, to write about that. And it's that linking, I think, um, that writing does. <laughs> 